You only have one life to live, so get the most out of it. On Good Life, Great Life, join me, Brian Highfield, and my guests as we share success stories, habits, mindsets, and lessons learned by successful people. These lessons are not taught in schools, but are critical for getting ahead in life. Whether you want a successful business or career, optimal health, or a lifestyle that most people just dream of, Good Life, Great Life has you covered. After retiring from a successful corporate career in my 40s, I founded multi-million dollar businesses in the sports and healthcare arenas. Now, I help everyday people maximize their lives and speak regularly at seminars, on podcasts, and radio shows to share principles on the topics of health, wealth, and happiness. Don't let a good life get in the way of a great life. Join me today on Good Life, Great Life. Well, welcome to another episode of Good Life, Great Life. And we have with us today a very special guest. We have Mr. Dave Brown, who is a serial entrepreneur. Welcome to the program, Dave. Thank you. I'm looking forward to listening and hearing your questions. Awesome. Well, give the audience just a little bit of rundown of, of your, your background and, and what inspired you to be an entrepreneur in the first place. Well, it started with my background is that... Um, I was traditionally educated. I was a magnet from Harvard in history. I went to Harvard Business School. I worked for General Foods, brought out Cool Whip. And um, I found out in the corporate organization that it didn't really matter what I did. It mattered how it looked. And I thought that was a little complicated. The other thing was that at General Foods, which is a good organization, that's bird's eye in particular, that the older seasoned people let me do what I wanted to, and we never got any advice and counsel. So here I was, I was 25, 26, and uh, I was, they approved everything I did, and we didn't have consultations. We had meetings and memos and this and that. So anyway, I decided that I wanted to go out and do my own thing for independence. My wife and I would like to do something like that. So I started the umbrella stroller, the first folding baby stroller. It was a big thing then because consumer products were not in, uh, were not uh, entrepreneurial very much. And I was a low cost guy. I, I figured that we'd bring this out. It looked very impressive. It folded up. But the number one thing, it was the least expensive product in the market. So we wound up with about 50% market share. So that was the first. APC was the second. APC is UPS company, MIT engineers. We were the low, we had the lowest cast of engineers. There's a saying Thorstein Veblen has, the more useful the activity, the less it's regarded. So this was useful. It was power engineering. So engineers, power engineers are the lowest cast of engineers. These are MIT guys who are brilliant. So we are the best and the lowest uh, way to protect the computer from surges and dips. Most people think of surges, but really dips are the problem when you turn on air conditioning because most computers are like uh, thoroughbred racehorses, not workhorses. So that is what manufacturing is, but the computers are very thoroughbred oriented. A little deviation, it blows up the system. So that's what we did. And um, I work with excellent people. We worked on the costs, but typical of MIT people, I'm the one that had to set up the factory because they were kind of too smart for that. So we set it up and we got a great CEO later who did a beautiful job and it was all about earning money. So in 1988, we went public because we made money. We weren't very big, but we made money. And we went all the way, no secondaries or anything else, sold to um, Schneider Electric for $6 billion. That was pretty good. So all the investors did really well. Then I went on to simplymedia.com. I do eBooks and audiobooks, which reaches back to my college days and history and literature into my high school days. So that's what I do. It's fun. I enjoy it. I'm old. I'm still doing it. I'm 78 years old and I'm still pumping away. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's a long list. A lot of exciting stuff. I remember, I remember those uh, APC units, uh, I think every, because I was a computer engineer. And so we, we had yeah, them under our desk. You know all about it, right. 
Yeah, and those those dips, I remember those because if you didn't have one and you're writing code, you lost you know, a day's worth of work. You know when the when the power dipped. <laughs> you see, that was what you see. You knew as an engineer, but most people didn't. And I went with Moore's law. We made it for PCs. With Moore's law, we, they would get there. So PCs like Ken Olson from Digital destroyed with his bias a great company because he thought there were toys. And I sold, I, I, I by the way, did, uh, I was a VAR for them for a while doing retail automation. And so he came and, you know, he talked about it and not an engine, you know, he was a biased engineer, not your experience. And he talked about them being toys. They said, well, I got 4,000 of, of your pieces out there. They all work. And I have your vaxes and they don't work. So what do you mean? I said, well, you got to surround them. You got to have support. I said, Mr. Olson, do you have any support for PCs? No, that's because they worked. And what was interesting is that company didn't make the next step. I don't know how you could use that, but think about taking the next step. How many companies can't go with what you knew practically? Pretty interesting. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, uh, I, I mean, in your, in your experience, um, you know, you're, you're an entrepreneur yourself. What, what are some of the, the life lessons you, you've learned just being an entrepreneur that you can share with aspiring entrepreneurs today? Well, the first thing is I wrote a book called The Entrepreneur's Guide because I was so tired about listening to all this thing about raising money and accountants and offices and all that. There are only four things you do. You sell it, you make it, you deliver it, and you get paid. That's all you do. <laughs> if you make it work, you can hire all those other people. But the other part that you and I were talking about earlier was that you've got to be able to live with ambiguity and uncertainty. And the people that get blown out are those people that can't handle it. I use, by the way, a good example, Harry Truman. Harry Truman was the president, would go to bed and sleep. And he said, well, Mr. Truman, how do you sleep? Oh, it's real simple. I can't do anything at night. I go to bed. He <laughs> could live with uncertainty. And many people can't live with it. And so I say that's rule one, temperament. You've got to be able to live with uncertainty. And the second thing is you got to be selling. And I point out, if you take a look at Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, Jeff Bezos, they get on the podium themselves and they're pitching like Willie Loman from the death of a salesman. They're up there pitching selling. So you, you have to sell. You can't, yes, you can hire other people, but those great companies, their leaders are the sales. Very important. Wait, I'd start with that. That's yeah. a big, that's a lot. If you can sell and you can live with uncertainty, you're going to have a good future. Yeah, and I heard a, a good a good question to ask people that are entrepreneurs because people that that aren't if they're if they're trading time for money just just kind of in a job they just kind of know what to expect. I, I show up to work, I'm going to get paid this, which is my my wage, my hourly rate, whatever. And the entrepreneurs, they, they're de like you said, they deal with so much uncertainty they don't they don't know if it's going to work out in the end. Um, and so the no. question, the question people asked entrepreneurs were, you know, how far are you willing to run when the distance is unknown? If you don't know how far it's going to go to reach your goal, are you willing to run, run it? And I think that really goes to what you're talking about with ambiguity and uncertainty. Yes, exactly. You should follow up on that because that's good. Keep going. Because the point is you don't know, you don't know when to know. It's really true. Yeah. Yeah. So what are, what are some other traits uh, that you find in successful entrepreneurs? The one thing that sounds odd, and I'm always surprised about it, is you've got to be conclusive and be willing to pull the trigger. I can't tell you how many people start out and contact me about this, that, and the other thing, and they don't know how to pull the trigger. <laughs> and the point is, you, you know, it's like... Um, Tom Peters said, it's ready, fire, aim, not ready, aim, 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 aim. You've just got to be willing to start. And you may go, the, you may be starting the wrong way, but you got to be able to pivot. That's the other thing. New data pivoting. 
So if you're an ideologue, and that's the problem with many people, they get committed to a point of view, that's what they do, and they forget that if you're in a hole, you should stop digging, and they keep digging. <laughs> there are so many areas that you've got to pivot, and I'll tell you, when we talk about this, let me tell you the three words I say that really irritate everybody the most, who, investors, customers, whoever, this is what it is, I was wrong. That's it. I'm going to pivot. Well, how can you pivot? How can you do it? I was wrong. Go back to point <laughs> A. So the point is you're going out there and testing and trying, and you're constantly redoing things. Clayton Christensen, one of the best books ever written. If you have, people haven't read it, they should read this book. This is worth this entire podcast and many more. Cheaper and Simpler Wins. This is Steve Jobs' favorite book, The Innovator's Dilemma. We've got it for $2.99. I'm pitching now on Audible and elsewhere as an audio book. And we've got the boiled down version. No business book should be more than 10 pages. So this is the, Clayton Christian boiled it down to eight pages. We have it as an audio book. But it's simpler and cheaper wins. That works. That's one thing that people don't talk about. And I think I mentioned this when we first talked about Apple. They don't talk about the fact Tim Cook was hired and appointed by Jobs because he was a cost guy. And Steve Jobs built Apple in 99 cent iTunes. People miss this. Cheap, affordable. Tim Cook worked on his costs. If you take a look, what, why did he bring chips in? You probably have heard about this. He's making his own chips. Yes, they're better, but they're cheaper. In finance, he's doing Apple Pay. He's bringing it in house. Why? It's cheaper. All innovation since the days of Adam Smith started with his pin factory in 1776. That's when he wrote the book, The Wealth of Nations, by being cheaper. Then we had canals, then we had railroads, now we have the internet. And think of Google, free. Think of Apple, cheap. I mean, I'm on an iPhone right now that's antique. I mean, I might be able to sell it that way <laughs> because the stuff works. So I'm saying an entrepreneur, you got to have the best cost. By the way, I'm supporting Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Peter Lynch. The durable competitive advantage is to be cheap. And most entrepreneurs say, I got a great product. It's twice as much as the other product, <laughs> but you're going to love it. When I did the umbrella, my point was the natural retail is $19.99. You can sell it for $14.99. Bang, it took off. So instead of all this, there's a saying in retail, if you sell the masses, you live with the classes. But if you sell the classes, you live with the masses. But you impress your neighbors. So a lot of people who are entrepreneurs are out there to strut their stuff. But cheap is where the money is. So that, I would say, those are the key points. Yeah, and I love what, the way you started out talking about, you know, start and then and then pivot because I really like that because uh, I deal, you know, with a lot of new entrepreneurs that are that are working their way right. out of being an employee. And and I just I love that. I love that because they they're just we always say they're they're getting ready to get ready. You know, they they don't actually start, they just keep getting ready all the time. Ready, aim, aim, aim. That's what uh listen, Tom Peters said it. And Clayton Christensen who wrote this book, a brilliant man who loves students. He taught at Harvard Business School. He had a lot of money, but he loved students. He loved to teach, and he loved to answer questions. So I asked him a question. What's the secret of entrepreneurs succeeding? He thought for a moment. He said, yeah, after their first mess up, if they've got enough money to go to do what they should do, they'll be fine. And he said, you get in business to get in business, and then you have to pivot. And if you take a look, I, you, you probably don't know this, but when I did the umbrella, 25 people in the industry turned it down. The only reason I got to do it was insiders didn't do it. At Xerox, um, it was called Haloid, 25 people, same number, had turned down xerography. Joe Wilson pivoted and said, we should do this, and away they went. Pivot, you've got to change when you, it, and as he said to me, 
As an entrepreneur, the way you make your money is for what comes through the door, if you're smart enough to recognize it. So you get in business to get in business, but then you got to pivot and think and react and change your mind. Most people can't do that. They're yeah. idealized. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think I think entrepreneurs are are kind of a, a rare breed of, of people. Now, some people say that you have to be kind of born with that entrepreneur gene. Um, do you think entrepreneurs are born that. or do you think that they, they can be developed? Well, the older they get and study DNA, they realize that there's a great saying, and all your parents can do is not screw you up. <laughs> because the point is you are what you are. My children, I noticed they were what they were from when they first were in my hands when they were delivered. The nervous, the this, the that. You are what you are. And that means it's very forgiving. That means if you're not an entrepreneur, uh, I was an entrepreneur before it was cool. Jobs and Gates made it cool. But when I did it, um, it was looked down upon. When I was at Harvard, my father was an academic. He was brilliant. My mother watered down the brains, but gave me durability. And the professors tried to get me not to go to business school because I was going to waste my life because entrepreneurs were not cool. Now, here's what was interesting. Ten years later, I was telling the dean of Harvard Business School, he said, yes, we did better when we weren't cool. So you see, the problem with entrepreneurship today, it's very important. It's thought to be cool. So people get into it like fashion, yeah. mini skirts, maxi skirts. <laughs> and the answer is, it's not meant for most people. If you take a look at the world, why? Look at the fan group, all American. Why? Because that's the way we are over here. You don't see the EU doing it. They're all, you know, they retired 50. That means I would be on the corporate for 28 years now. The idea over there is they've got one of their best selling books is don't work. Find a way around it. Well, here we like to work. We like to be involved. It's like you, you and I enjoy this. You know, we like doing this. This is what we do. So entrepreneurs are born, I really believe it. You can't train somebody to be an entrepreneur. It's, it's, it's all instinctive. It's all, I don't know. You can't, like hitting a baseball. Yeah. You know, some people can do it and some can't hit the baseball. I really think that's true. What do you think? Yeah, and I, I used to, I say it too. I used, to, I used to tell people like, well, there's only about 4% of people out there that have that entrepreneur gene. Um, I do think, and maybe, maybe this is kind of an extension of that where, I feel like situations, you know, when, when we're pressured, when we're between a rock and a hard place, it, it can squeeze us to the point where we, we really become entrepreneurial. I'm thinking about all the economic disasters we've had, you know, all the downturns, you know, you had the Great Recession 2008, 2009, before that, 9-11, and just more recently with the pandemic and everything, um, well, forced people into certain something. situations where they had to become entrepreneurial. Yeah, but in 2008 was a cakewalk compared to seven, uh, 1974. If you take a look at 2008, not many companies disappeared. Not many banks went away. Mm -hmm. Man, it was devastation in 1974. It was a cakewalk. So the point is, we've had such prosperity because of the internet saving money. Even And by the way, not many companies work at saving money. I only invest in companies saving money. There aren't many of them. Most of them build up corporate. Ask yourself a question, entrepreneurial. I'm on this with you. I'm selling everybody in my business. I sell the Fang Group, Walmart. Well, we're cheap. That's why. And I sell Spotify, and Shopify, and other people. Why am I on with you? Because we don't do any foo-foo here. <laughs> Entrepreneurs know how to sell, make it, and deliver. This is part of that. And most of the corporate guys to get all this money, I have no idea why they pay them all this money. Um, and then the people paid all that money have to have other people working for them to justify the money. And they want to bring them back in the offices because if they don't bring them in the offices, they'll just do the work. Then they won't need the managers. So where the opportunity is, again, is costs. If you can tell your people listening to you, find a way to cut the cost. If you can cut the costs, and I think even Apple has 
50% too many people, 60%. Uh, P&G, IBM went in there and they thought they had 65% too many. You ask them, I mean, I don't know about what you see, but take us. Everybody ACH is this money. That means electronic. Mm -hmm. I haven't had to visit anybody in six years. That's a long time. Yeah. They, we automatically upload to them. This is why the fan group makes money, low costs. You never hear that. So if you're an entrepreneur, find a way to cut the costs. And I will stop carrying on now. Go ahead. <laughs> Now, I want to I want to circle back because you mentioned a, a couple of books. What are your favorite books? What should be the go-tos for, for people really wanting to, to learn and understand business? Besides your own. <laughs> besides, besides the uh, the, you know, the entrepreneurial guide or the on, entrepreneur's guide, what else would you recommend? The first book anybody should listen to, and I think you should listen to it, we have it, is the reduced version of the innovator's dilemma. It's like the days of Socrates, a lecture length. And he is Harvard Business Press. And this is about the innovator's dilemma is cheaper and simpler wins. You, you can't go wrong with a book. Steve Jobs only liked one business book. This was it. He dined off this book. If you want to know about Apple, I tell somebody, I, people invest all this money. They haven't even read the book that he read. I mean, it's like a minister not reading the Bible. Read the Bible. The other one I would read is Made in America by Sam Walton. And this is how Walmart built it. And what's interesting to me is I have not met anybody at Walmart who ever read the book. Hmm. Again, it's like being a minister not reading the Bible. Hmm. Made in America, Sam Walton. The other ones we have I like very much are Peter Drucker, who is probably the best in this field of anybody in the field. He's kind mm -hmm. of the, what you would call the moat side of business. I like managing oneself. That's about your learning style and other people's learning style. In other words, if I'm communicating with you, I've got to find out your learning style. What is your learning style? Then I have to tailor what I do to your learning style. And if I do that, we will have a successful relationship. If I don't, we'll be two ships passing in the night. So take those three. Uh, the other one is emotional intelligence, which is good. That's Goldman. And um, we've got those books. And the place to go, I mean, I'm proselytizing and quit pitching myself at simplymedia.com, but Harvard Business Review has them all. And they've got a very good group. But what's interesting, and I, you might comment on this, I haven't seen a good book they brought out that's useful for business. It's all kind of self-righteous blather to me in 15 years. I don't know what that's all about. Yeah, and, and a lot of what I've seen are just kind of these same, the same ideas in these older books, just, just kind of rewritten as if they're brand new ideas. And I remember reading um, Think and Grow Rich for the first time, not even knowing uh, the history of who wrote it and when it was written. And, and I'm, and all of a sudden I start seeing references to yes. people that were alive a hundred years ago. And I'm like, wait a minute, when was this book written? I thought it was written like within a past couple of years. And it was, you know, it was written a hundred years ago. Napoleon, Napoleon is, um, what's his name? Hill. Napoleon, Napoleon Hill, Hill yeah. mm -hmm. is excellent. And that fits right in with what you said. He wrote it a hundred years ago. Albert, Hubbard, another one. I mean, the point is business is very basic. And if you know, the point is if you fancy it, like you, you know, it's a mistake. That's why I keep focusing on the fact of I, I, I have this comment. I've got second rate intelligence. I'm not stupid, but I'm not first rank. I room with a guy that got a uh, Nobel Prize. That'll put in physics. You know, there are no dumb physicists. Yeah, right. So the point was, you would rearrange formulas. I was doing second year calc, uh, second year physics. And that's pretty good. But he was so far ahead of me, he tried to compete. But what I learned was, I had it gave me a credential at Harvard, so I could be simple, and they would think I was eccentric but not stupid. <laughs> and I think one of the problems people have is they're unwilling to be simple. As I said, sell it, make it, deliver it, and get paid for it. The magic of our business now is we're doing downloads. The magic of 
people miss this about Apple. I don't understand how they can miss it. They make 72% in their services business. 72, big number. They grew 23.5% last year. They would be a Fortune 35 company alone. That's the driver. And the razor is everything else they do. The blaze is this business, which is running. And how does it work? They're cheap. They're simple. Never talked to them. Five. Think about it. I haven't talked to them 15 years. They don't have meetings. They don't, you know, they don't virtue signal. They don't get into all this peripheral stuff. So if you can encourage people to concentrate and cost the win, you don't have to tell anybody you're concentrating on it. But the point is, you want to, at the end of the day, like I used to say at, U, at, at APC, oh, yeah, and by the way, we're the cheapest guy out there. Ooh, close the deal. Yeah. Eighty <laughs> percent of people's eighty percent of people's decisions are based on costs, according to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big number. A absolutely. Absolutely. So what books do you like the best? What are your well, two or three best? Uh, books? You know, yeah, I mentioned Think and Grow Rich. I think it's I think it's a go to. I think Rich Dad Poor Dad. I learned I learned a lot from Robert Kiyosaki uh in that um seven habits is always always yes. fundamental uh, yes so those, those are some of my top three just must must reads for anyone in business I, well, we're, we're right out of time and yes, I, can, I, can, I, I, I can i can talk to you all day i, I just love our conversation here uh we're running out of time here how can our audience get in in touch with you or, or learn more about you and, and connect with what you're doing Well, I hope they'll go to simplymedia.com and you can buy from us, but better buy. We got 806 titles that are $2.99. Better to go to our partner section and find it. We sell everybody, Audible, uh, Kindle, all those people, and buy the books. And they're only $2.99. That's less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And, uh, you know, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and I'm on Facebook, but I learn from you. You see, I've written down right here the three books you mentioned. Now I've got something to think about. And the point is, it, that's what it's about. It's dialogue. And by the way, uh, let's mention that uh, Charlie Munger and um, Warren Buffett spend six hours a day reading and learning. If they can do it, we can do it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. thanks. I, I loved it. We'll talk again, maybe. Yeah, ab like. absolutely. I love the interview and then love to have you on again sometime. So uh, thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate it. Just let me know. And by the way, uh, I'm at, uh, just so you know, I think you may know this if you don't, I'm at simplymedia2 at gmail.com. Just email uh -huh. me. Awesome. Anyway, we'll thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed it. I learned something. That's pretty good. Yeah, I love it. I love it when we can all learn from each other. This is great. Good. Take care. And All right. Thank you, you too. Again. Thank you so much, Dave. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.